Welcome to the First Unitarian Universal Church of Austin Public Affairs Forum. This forum occurs every week uh, at noon on Sundays and is free and open to the public. Please see the website austinuu.org for more information. And now I'll introduce Dale, who will be introducing our speaker. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, thank you for attending our Public Affairs Forum today. We have a special guest, Joseph Kopser and he's going to discuss with us his experiences as, as an Army officer and what it has taught him about the effective management of our energy resources. He is the CEO and co-founder of Ride Scout, an Austin startup, working to revolutionize how people view ground transportation. He is also co-chair of the Defense Energy Summit. He served 20 years in the U.S. Army, and in November of 13, the White House recognized him as the champion for change for his work as a veteran in clean energy. In addition, he is a Next Generation Project Texas Fellow at the Strauss Center for International Security and Law at UT with focus on energy policy. He serves on the board of directors of the Clean Texas Foundation and a founding member of the steering committee for Defense Energy Center of Excellence Initiative. He lives in Austin with his wife and three daughters and his goal has been to develop and improve our national energy security policy and energy ecosystem starting in transportation and in public and defense energy usage. So think of some good questions. We'll bring the microphones to you after he finishes, and we hope to uh, tickle your brains this morning. Come on, Joseph. Come up and help us. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Dale. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, first off, I just want to say thanks for coming out this afternoon. And for those of you that are watching on TV, uh, let me apologize in advance because I might disappoint some of you. I don't know what your expectations are based on my bio or what I might talk about. Uh, but one of the interesting facts, uh, one of the interesting facts I love pointing out is that the way I grew up and where I grew up in the uh, 1980s, the two biggest influences in my life that shaped kind of my view of the world and how I see everything uh, was Ronald Reagan and John Lennon. So if you could imagine what a person would be like at the age of 43 if Ronald Reagan and John Lennon were their two biggest inspirations outside of their family, that's me. So I might frustrate you. I might seem like I'm contradicting what I'm saying five minutes into my uh, message. But in honesty, uh, in all honesty, in my brain, it all kind of makes sense. Uh, what I want to really get at is a couple of different subjects. First and foremost, there are some staggering facts that impact all of us that I just want to throw out on the table, and we can take this discussion any direction you want uh, after I give a few minutes of brief remarks because it's the discussion, the two-way, that I enjoy the most. The first is the fact that we waste, flat-out waste, 1.6 billion gallons of fuel just sitting in traffic. I'm not talking about moving people around. You've got to move around. I'm talking about... When congestion brings traffic to a standstill, they can actually measure that, and we've wasted 1.6 billion gallons of fuel. Probably worse than that, 4.6 billion hours of our time, when you add up everybody that gets stuck in traffic, happens when you're just stuck either on Mopac, 2222, I-35, Cesar Chavez on a Saturday afternoon in downtown, just sitting there doing nothing, 4.6 billion hours. And the inexcusable statistic that drives me crazy and it drives me to wake up early every morning to not only work towards defense energy but also in the world of uh, Ride Scout and what we do here in Austin and other cities across the country is that we kill, flat out kill, 11,000 people every year in DUIs. That is such a preventable statistic, we should all be ashamed of ourselves that we allow 11,000 people to be killed in an accident in which a large vehicle drives into or hurts other people or kills that driver when there are so many easy ways to stop DUI. And the biggest one, get people to where they're going having fun without their car. That's really easy. It's just that simple. But we as society have figured out that, oh, there's these conveniences and, oh, there's these barriers and, oh, there's these problems we have about rules and litigation. That it's just too hard. I just need to drive my own car. And then you start rationalizing one beer, two beer, three glasses of wine, maybe a margarita, and before you know it, you lead to that terrible statistic. Now, that's the Americans we kill 
here inside of the United States. What also fires me up, after 20 years in the military, are the tens of thousands of people injured and thousands of service members killed every year on our, in my opinion, over-reliance on foreign oil. And let's be very specific, and I'm talking about in countries that don't like us. Flat out, we import oil from countries that do not like us, and then we have become dependent on that oil, and we send our service member men and women to go over and secure those lines of communication to keep that oil coming from countries that do not like us. And then we're real surprised when we end up in conflict and wars around the world. But here's the thing. It's not just wars around the world. Our dependence on energy comes in a lot of different ways. But before I get too deep into all of this, you know, the very kind uh, introduction pointed out, please turn off your cell phones and whatnot. Uh, I live in a world right now that if we don't talk about some of these things and the word doesn't spread, then we were just wasting our time. So if you are on Facebook, if you are on Twitter, if you do live in the world of social media, if that's your means of communication, get on it right now and start following along. If this isn't in the world of social media where you live and you're more of a forum hosting organization, keep doing it. Because if a tree falls in the woods and nobody heard that we had this discussion, it would be a real shame because in here, one of you all has an idea that's going to give me another idea and our company, we're going to go act out on it. Because here's the secret. I've actually never had an original thought in my entire life. I've actually just copied all these great ideas of mentors and friends and family members and people much smarter than me that I've met in school over the and then just tried to bring their ideas to bear. So here's what's happening in my opinion. It's this over-reliance on preserving access to energy. You can't see this slide real well, but if you could, that squiggly little S-shape is the side of a mountain in Afghanistan. And those containers in those vehicles, most of it's bulk fuel or bulk water, resupplying our soldiers, marines, sailors, and airmen in Afghanistan because there's no way to refine fuel. Our vehicles are so over-reliant upon fuel, specifically carbon-based fuel, that we have to truck it in. And when we truck it in, you get that bottom picture. It's kind of hard to make out, but what you're looking at is the silhouette of a giant explosion. This is an explosion 10 stories tall by 10 stories wide of a fuel container that was on a convoy with American soldiers delivering it out to the hinterlands where we were fighting just to put fuel in our generators, in our vehicles, to power our computers, to power our communications. And then the foreground silhouette is other army vehicles and tanks that are part of that convoy delivering it out. So think about this ridiculous do loop we've created where to secure the lines of energy in countries and some of them that don't like us, we get into wars and conflicts to preserve it. The equipment we use requires energy and carbon-based fuels, a heavy reliance on them, and then our soldiers to go and deliver them out there are susceptible to explosions, ambush, and worst of all, death, just delivering it out there. It's this ridiculously terrible loop that's got to end. And I personally have made it a life's passion because I've met these soldiers. I've lost friends in combat, and some of them as ridiculous and as necessary as just delivering fuel. It's got to end. It maybe can't end on my watch, but I will sure as heck do all I can with friends and others to reduce it. And what I'm really excited about Austin, Texas is we're in a re really re unique region to make it happen. We're at the crossroads here in Austin, Texas of carbon-based fuels in a state whose legacy was built in large part because of oil and natural gas. And I'll get into it a little bit about the opportunities that we have with the fact we're sitting on so many natural sources of energy from wind, solar, geothermal, etc. We have a real opportunity to do something differently. So that's why I'm uh, very proud to call Austin my home now. Here's this other reason that I go crazy when it comes to energy. Look at these pictures. That even if people were taking public transit more, which sadly they're not, we have 40-foot buses with empty seats that carry around two people because the way that the lines were designed and people's uh, uh, attitudes towards public transit don't incentivize them to get on the buses, so we run these big, giant buses all around with nobody on them. Or worse yet, we've got this ridiculous uh, over-regulated taxi industry with all these rules that so burden taxi cab drivers, they underserve the population 
As you get these ridiculous scenes, all these yellow cabs are at a large airport waiting to pick people up because taxi cab drivers aren't dumb. They realize the biggest fares they're going to get are from the airport, which is outside of a town, into downtown or into the suburbs. They'll often, especially in Austin, Texas, they'll wait an hour, two, three hours waiting in their cars. And on hot days, they're running their engine, just waiting to come get in the queue to be the next person to pull up in front of you there at Austin Airport to take you back to where you need to go. And it's like this repeated over and over and over again in every city in the U.S. And then the uh, other picture there, pick any part of the country you want to call that. That's our over-reliance on cars to get us around. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against cars. What Henry Ford did with mobility in the early part of the last century to bring mobility to the common person was phenomenal. But he, Henry Ford was all about mobility, not just the car, but we lost our way along the way the last 100 plus years. We became so car-centric that now on our highways and byways, 76%, 76% of all the cars on the road only have one person in them. Most cars were designed with four to five seats. Most buses have 40 seats. Most trains can hold up to two, 300 people. We have so many seats available in the United States. We have about 1.3 billion seats in vehicles right now. We have so overstructured ourselves for seats and for vehicles because we're not using them efficiently. And if you do the math and say 330 million Americans were on the road on or about an hour, hour and a half each day to and from work, play, school. If you did the math, I'll jump to the secret at the end, 98.6% of all the seats available in the U.S. right now have nobody in them. They're sitting idle. They're sitting idle in these parking lots around our building today. They're sitting idle in your parking lots near your house, your neighbors, all of us. Now, those of you that are already car-free, car light, I applaud you. You are role models for all of us. But I'm not asking you to give up your car. I'm just asking you to use it more efficiently because of the impacts. I mean, if you were a restaurant and you only put two people out of your 100 tables in a night, you'd go out of business. If you were an airline and you had this big, giant aircraft and only 2% of your seats were filled, you'd never take off. But yet in the United States, when it comes to transportation, we take that as for granted. Oh, yeah, yeah. 98.6% empty rate, that's fine, we can keep doing that. But we can't keep doing that, and luckily, millennials are starting to figure this out. Those little icons you see, those are apps for mobile phones, for smartphones, like Android and iOS, your iPhone. And what those icons represent is a whole slew of responses from the private sector, because millennials aged 20 to 35 would rather pay data on their phone with their last dollar then put a gallon of gas in their car. And that's a beautiful thing that's going to take, you talk about the greatest generation after World War II, this current generation of millennials might be the generation that gets us off foreign oil in the way that we are today from countries that don't like us because they're less wedded to the car than any generation before them. 16% of them as a, part, as a cohort of the population five years ago owned cars. That percent now is down to 12%. The automobile makers, some of them are shaking in their boots. Some of them, on the other hand, are being very innovative. They're moving away from just making cars, and they're going back to Henry Ford's original dream, mobility for the common person. And we're going to talk about what that means in different ways. What my company does, though, is recognize there's really three things going on. One is people, all of us, regardless of age, regardless of proximity in life, socioeconomic background, we all have to move. You did to get here, you did to go to work, you did it for most of your lives. It's so commonplace, and yet we don't realize how dependent we are on cars. And yet, if we could just tell you how to get from point A to point B, assemble all the public transportation so simply with little pretty maps that showed you where to go walk and the exact number of the bus, and it told you your stop is second in Congress, get off there. If we could restore what's called bus literacy, we could make it really easy for people to get around without their car. And for those of you that never stepped on a public bus, even Austin that has a bad rap for public transit, it's getting much better. And with new improvements like 801, it's getting really good in certain areas, but there's still work to be done. But the second thing I discovered in this, this uh, project of Ride Scout that went from a hobby and a passion to now a full company is that companies want your business. Hey, at the end of the day, they want your butts in their seats. This 98% empty seat rate, they know. 
They want to maximize. When they put a cab out on the street, they want people in it all, all day long. When they put a bus on the road, they want people in it all day long. So we can connect rider and driver together. And municipalities, cities, that's your tax dollars. That's the money you pay off of money from the pump that goes out of the gas tax. That's money you pay with property tax that goes to maintain your, ro- your roads, your bridges, your rail. Municipalities spend billions in this country on transportation, and yet they can't measure whether or not something's working because there's no holistic way to see all of it. So what we did with our company, engineers right here in Austin, Texas, and we're all over the country now, is we've done this. We've created a funnel, if you will, from a digital technology perspective, and we brought all the services in public transit and the backbone, the digits behind what they're doing, and brought them into our app. We took all of the information that's publicly or privately available from companies like Zipcar and Cartago, taxi companies, and we brought it all into the app. Then we took everything that's out there in ride share and car share, <coughs> excuse me, and we brought it into the app. And this is what you get. These three screens, which you can't see here, but that's okay. I'll explain them. If you just simply want to see what's around you, and for millennials that have these smartphones in their hand, they're like me. They're, they're practically sewn to my hand now because I live and die by my smartphone. You can see a map that geolocates to where you're standing, and then we show you all the bus stops that are around you. And when you move your icon, your target, over top of that bus stop, it pops up and it says, that's the 801. It's heading south, and it'll be here in four minutes. And it's like, ah, that's what I needed to know. In the case of car share, car rental, if you pass over top of it, we show you availability where it is. If you just say, I'm here and I want to go down to City Hall, we then line everything up that middle view, which is like how you buy an airline ticket. You go on Kayak or Priceline or Expedia. You look for cities, you look for airlines, you look for prices, but at the end of the day, you go with what makes sense for your schedule by time and by cost. And we do the same thing with our smartphone. And then in addition to that, we have all kinds of cool features for people that do bike share or whatever else. This is this new greatest generation I'm talking about, the millennials. I won't get into the statistics too much because you can't read that slide from the distance, but there's 80 million of them in this country. 60 million of them carry smartphones in their pocket, 20 million of them are on college campuses, and 14 million of them are full-time students. Captured audiences in dense locations where transportation is a problem for them. So if you can align their incentive to reduce costs, they keep more, more of their precious money that they have, whether they're in college or they're working professional millennials, and then at the same time recognize that Texting is not a distraction to driving, like you might think it is. Millennials think that driving is a distraction to texting. And if they can do anything to not have to get offline so they can continue to communicate with peers, friends, and colleagues, then if they don't have to drive, they don't want to drive. Good on them. Because if they're not driving, they're better utilizing something else that already exists, and they're not putting one more car on the road alone by themselves with one person in the car. So, by the way, Tim Pompadreo, who is the uh, Deputy Director for Strategy at San Francisco Municipal Transit, that's his quote about texting and driving. I want to give him full credit. I just stole it. In the brief history of our company, when we launched in Washington, D.C. Uh, in November, the most staggering statistic so far is 1.1 million events. What we mean by an event, that's somebody poking on our app, looking to find out bus times, looking to find available bike share, looking to find car share, looking to find another person leaving. So, and that's just in six months. A little old Austin company goes into Washington, D.C. Since then, we've launched in Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Boston, two days from now. Or actually, you'll read about it in the Chicago Tribune tomorrow morning. We're launching in um, Chicago. And what's really neat about all this is that people are taking note. But most excitedly for all of us are these guys. And I won't go into the details, but each one of those rectangles represents an honest-to-goodness company who has assets that they want to better, more effectively manage in the marketplace. Whether it's a rental car company or a bike share company or a limo company, they want to get to where the consumer is, i.e. the millennial standing there on the street corner with his or her smartphone saying, I'm here and I want to go there. Well, they want to get their service in front of you. So it's a market-based solution. It's not government picking winners and losers. It's not government studying something for six months. It's you, the consumer. You determining the speed at which you travel. You determining the time at which you travel. You determining the cost at which you want to travel. You determining the hassle, the number of connections and modes you want to travel with. You determining your, your level of 
safety. Your level of understanding of traditional transportation, like limousines and taxis, if it's ride for hire, or the new emerging stuff. What I mean by that is Lyft and Sidecar and Uber and some of these companies you've heard about in the news. They're ride for hire no differently than taxis. They're just new. Some people like them, some people don't. The great part about being a company in the middle of all this is the marketplace wants to be a part of it. Universities, which are like little cities, they have housing, they have transportation, they have roads, they have parking garages, they have all the problems of cities. They're little tiny cities within cities. They are coming at us. Little known schools like MIT and Georgetown, schools that understand complex problems are coming to Right Scout, and we're thrilled because we're helping them settle big problems they have. Thousands of people descend upon their campus in the morning. Thousands of people leave their campus in the evening. In, day in, day out. Day in, day out. Parking and transit are a problem. Plus, they want to be responsible to the needs of their students, not just staff and faculty, but their students that they know are going out for entertainment and drinking and drinking to an excess where they shouldn't be behind the wheel of a vehicle. And if a university can save the life of one kid on campus, just one kid, it's worth every dollar they're spending on trying to bring all these assets to bear in one place. And the fact that we're not only doing good things for people, making their lives easier, not only are we doing things well for the planet by reducing carbon emissions and using everything better, but we're also making profits for our investors. It's a market-based solution. People, planet, profits. It's the triple pundit, the triple P, whatever you want to call it. We've, we've captured all three of those categories, and that's why it's exciting, and that's why we're growing uh, at the rate we are. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. Uh, I spent 20 years in the United States Army defending the dream of free enterprise. I mean, that's the whole reason why, in many ways, the United States military exists, is to protect the Constitution of the United States. And when you look at the Constitution of the United States and the way it's set up, it sets up things like freedom of speech, freedom of travel, freedom of religion, freedom from religion, all these things that we do, but one of them at the end of the day is to protect free enterprise. Smart, well-regulated enterprise, but now after spending 20 years defending the American dream of free enterprise, I get to participate in it, and that's pretty cool. And I don't mind that at all. Uh, but we're getting a lot of attention in a lot of different places. Uh, tomorrow, like I say, the Chicago Tribune uh, has a story about us launching into Chicago. TechCrunch Magazine, San Francisco Magazine. Uh, it's pretty neat. They, they fall into three buckets. They either like it because we're helping people, i.e. from a transportation standpoint, and they think that's great, or they like it because we're moving in from a high-tech standpoint, we're using existing resources better, uh, more efficiently, or... They are doing stories on us because we're veterans, combat veterans out of Iraq and Afghanistan that are coming back doing great things uh, in the private sector. Like, that's something new. And I love to point out, I'm like, you do realize that George Washington, when he was done serving in the Army, went back to his plantation and was one of the biggest bourbon whiskey distillers in all of Virginia. I mean, he, at the end of the day, was a businessman. Now, he was called back into service when his country said, we need somebody to be the president, our first president. And he said, okay, sure. But this tradition of people leaving the military to go into the private sector is nothing new. It has happened after every major war we've ever had. And this current generation of veterans coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan, I'm especially proud to be associated with because we saw some really terrible stuff in Iraq and Afghanistan. What I saw, besides the injury and death to friends and colleagues alike, was our rover reliance on energy. So that's what I'm tackling. And transportation is the lowest hanging fruit there. But I have friends that are taking on huge issues in healthcare, huge issues in science and technology, huge issues in terms of how we take care of our veterans. Pick any category you want. Uh, we, we are going to do our best to be another great generation. Uh, and the other thing is, after you've given uh, young Americans, specifically young Americans, opportunities overseas where they would... Uh, in one particular case, they, they took an entire platoon of soldiers out to a prison in northern Iraq because the Iraqis were no longer able to secure it well enough, and bad guys we were catching, putting in prison, were just escaping back out again. We're like, we have got to take over this prison. We don't want to, but we have got to do it. So they took a platoon of soldiers, put them out there in charge. So now you have a 25-year-old platoon leader with a 28-year-old company commander and all of their soldiers, 100-plus folks, running a prison with thousands of inmates? 
They did not get a degree in criminology. They did not get a degree in uh, how to run a prison. But like all of us, it's the American spirit. It's our DNA. We assemble a team. We identify the real problem. And then we don't sweat the petty small stuff that might get in the way of others to accomplish our mission. And that's what veterans are really good at doing, uh, and that's why I'm proud to be associated. But let me just back up real quick, because uh, I want to get to your questions. You all don't want to hear me talk the whole time. This is our secret sauce. This is what we're really excited about. We're not just trying to be a company that aggregates all the stuff you've heard of and brings it together in an app for, for folks to get around, but we want to bring in stuff you've never heard of, but yet in that community, at that hyper-local level, they love it. Anybody ever been to Detroit? Detroit's got these awesome buses. They call them the bar buses. That after the games, they have these old school buses that they've painted, you know, to all these cool murals. They go out to see the Tigers fans and all the different uh, football, baseball, hockey fans, grab them as they're coming out of the stadium, and safely transport them to their bar. But that gets them more business. They're not driving. And at the end of the day, if they get home safely, which I presume they do, it's a great deal. But Google's not going to put them in Google Maps. So on the front end, it looks like Kayak, where you get all your options. But on the back end of the app that we're building, it looks like eBay, where Ma and Pa companies at the small level can put in their four-person taxi company in Ithaca, New York, or the person that owns 100 share bike bicycles on South Beach, Miami, can load them in, or a pedicab company in Austin, Texas, can load up their company so they can get to market where people are, wherever it happens. Uh, let me just kind of skip down here. Here's the other really neat thing. This is a, a snapshot from the Wall Street Journal I took after uh, an essay that they invited me to write appeared. We are taking this idea of being good stewards of our environment and good stewards of the economy and good stewards of resources, which, if you want to throw it into the political arena, for a very long time, the energy or the environmental debate, and I'll be very frank, gets a bad name because they think it's only the hippies, only the tree huggers, or only the sandal wearers that care about our environment. And I say, heck no. Not only do more people other than how you want to over-stereotype, first of all, it was great to have their leadership for so many decades when no one else was paying attention to the environment, but now a lot more people are good stewards, if you will, or involved in it, and I'm like I say, champion this idea that veterans, of all people, ought to be concerned about how much carbon-based fuel we're relying on. Because if something goes wrong again, guess who has to go back and secure it, defend it, and bring it back again? It's us. And when I was writing about in the Wall Street Journal is that the sharing economy, this better use of resources, is nothing new in our country. This idea of Airbnb, maybe you haven't heard about it, but Airbnb is a way to be able to allow people to take their hotel, or their um, spare bedroom or a room above an attic or a room above a garage and rent it out to people who come in for South by Southwest. When we over inundate our hotel industry, it provides a secondary market. And you can rent out space in your house. It's not subleasing. It's like little tiny temporary hotel room. And then there are people who have taken your automobile, the second car you have that you rarely ever drive, and let you put that onto a market known as Get Around, and people can fly into Austin, look it up on the Internet or on their smartphone, find your car in the driveway, call you and say, okay, I'd like to rent your car for the week, and then you happily turn the keys over. And all the insurance is taken care of. Don't worry about all that. It's all taken care of. But it's this idea of the sharing economy. It goes all the way back to the first traditions of our country. I like to point out that the whole reason why the pilgrims ended up where they were, they are supposed to go farther south, but you know why they stopped the Plymouth Rock, right? They ran out of beer. I'm serious. Look that up. That is in the history books. Okay? They all loved being together in the early days of our country with our common uh, houses and our common greens where we would pick one patch of land in the middle, let all of our animals all come down to and serve on together and feed and graze. Sharing just like barn raising, is the American DNA. It's now taken a new uh, layer, a new evolution, because what we're doing with smartphone and mobile technology to be, take it and apply it to transportation. So that's why I said at the very beginning, you know, Ronald Reagan and John Lennon were two of my biggest influences outside of family growing up as a kid. So it makes perfect sense to me that the Wall Street Journal or Fox Business News would have Ride Scout on to talk about what we're doing because we're doing it in a way, like Willie Nelson said about Austin, Texas. We're bringing the hippies and the cowboys together. We're bringing folks that have a tradition of oil and gas 
together with new and alternatives. We're bringing inner city and rural together. We're bringing all kinds of diverse backgrounds to the table and the discussion, in this case, about transportation as applies to energy. Uh, I won't go into details about the millennials. I kind of already hit that and what their habits are. It's a wonderful thing. And I like to end, to take your questions, on this picture, because even though it's an automobile, I want to reiterate, uh, Ride Scout, me personally, we have nothing against the automobile. Nothing. It's when it's used inefficiently. But they managed to fill all four seats. I presume they have their seatbelts on. No one there is drinking if they're driving. And there's nothing wrong with that as well. Because at the end of the night, I hope they park that car somewhere safe at someone's house and then take the 801 to get down to SoCo or East uh, Austin, wherever they want to be. And at the end of the night, open up Ride Scout and compare the prices between, say, a taxi or a bus. I forget how long it would take them to walk because I don't want them riding a bike and I don't want them driving a car. At the very beginning, I pointed out again, we're wasting fuel, we're wasting our time, and we're killing people unnecessarily, not only here in the States due to DUI, but then overseas when we're securing all this. So that was as quick as I could in 30 minutes to get through all of it. I can't wait to get to your questions because, like I said, I've never had an original thought in my life, and I want to take some of the ideas that you all give me through your questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'm just going to say, I don't know the answer, but I'm certainly going to keep it in the back of my mind to try to tackle that problem later. So. Thank you for your presentation, Joseph. Um, I'd like for you to touch a little bit on um, what the military is doing now in energy conservation. Uh, I think you just barely touched on it, but I think people would be interested to know that military bases are sort of in a transition to a more uh, low-carbon economy. Could you kind of go over some of the, yeah, the improvements so the, that are being made because you got an award for mm -hmm. that. So the U.S. Department of Defense is the single largest consumer of energy in the world, period, the DOD. They burn more fuel and consume more fuel than any entity in the world. And in the past, they didn't have to really worry about how much they were consuming because if a general or admiral banged their fist on the table and said, I need more fuel and energy, Smart NCOs and sergeants and officers brought all that food ne or, uh, fuel necessary forward. We just can't sustain ourselves like that anymore. Not just because from a tactical level it's less efficient on the battlefield if you're pulling soldiers off the line to then defend fuel, but it's also just flat out fiscally irresponsible. It's just, it's, it, we're just spending way too much money. Some estimates are that by the time you take the fuel and you actually pump it into the side of a vehicle in Afghanistan, that the, the, the fully burdened cost of everything we spent to get that fuel there, to fly it in, to drop it in, and by the time you pump it into the gas tank, it's a $400, $400 gallon of fuel. He can't sustain that. So we're thinking about how we do it smarter. And here's the great thing. The DOD is so big that when the Department of Defense moves in ways that help society, we all benefit. Standard gauge railroad in the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln, it drove them crazy that to get a troop of regiment from Maine down to the front in the south, the troops would load up cargo and people on one train company's trains, make it as far south as Boston, you know, north end, and then would have to get off, get onto another train at South Station because the two different railroad companies had two different size gauges. You see, if you wanted to get on our trains, you've got to have a gauge that's this wide, but to get on these trains, you've got to have a gauge that wide. Abraham Lincoln made it real easy. He said, if you want our money you'll have a standard gauge railroad because I want those soldiers to be able to go from Maine to Virginia without getting off the train. And that is what happens when the Department of Defense puts their mus muscle and their energy behind something, whether it be computers, the Internet. I mean, God bless Al Gore, but it was really the Department of Defense that built the backbone of what we know to be the uh, Department of the Internet. Silicon Valley and all the wonderful things that came out of there, the Palo Alto Research Center, that's what happens when the Department of Defense says, we're going to fix this problem, and we need to be able to communicate with the universities better, faster, stronger, and the seeds of the Internet came from that. And look what was created there. So what we're trying to create right here now in Austin, Texas, based on leadership that's coming out of the DOD saying, we want our soldiers to be able to fight more effectively with more fight, less fuel. Not being less effective because they can't drive as fast because their vehicles don't have the fuel they need. No, sir, no, ma'am. Just as effective, in fact, more effect effective 
Because when soldiers are going up the hillside and they're not carrying 15 pounds of batteries or two or three gallons of fuel to be able to take them up the side of a mountain, they become more effective when they can chase the bad guys who, oh, by the way, aren't carrying fuel and batteries and they can run a lot faster. So if you can unhitch that buffalo, unhitch that burden based on carbon-based fuels, then our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines are even more effective. And then the last thing I'll say to that is the DOD is spending money to solve this problem. Of all the budgets that are going down in the DOD, smart defense energy projects are one of those that are staying where they are. And in some cases, they're increasing, which is good for all of us, because the spin-off technologies that come out of standard gauge railroad, that come out of the Internet, that come out of nuclear engineering, that come out of uh, modern medicine, so many things happen. You know, the congresswoman in Arizona, when she was shot in the head during that morning, January 8th, a few years ago on that tragic day, do you know who they called? They called two military doctors. Because sadly, guess who has the most experience in traumatic medicine when it comes to bullets through the brain? It's the military. So we are pioneers in so many things that you may not know, but I'm here to A, tell the story, and B, be most optimistic about the fact that when it comes to defense energy, it might be the person you last suspected, the Department of Defense, that actually gets us off of an over-dependence on foreign oil from countries that don't like us for all kinds of reasons. So thanks for asking that question. Oh, just a quick statement. I think you should have a theme song, Steve Earle's Back to Houston. And uh, also whether you've ever heard of General Smedley Butler that said war is a racket. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there's all kinds of uh, great quotes that are out there. One of my favorite was out of the general that was running the theater of operations in Afghanistan who said that operational energy equals operational effectiveness because it was driving him crazy. He had to pull soldiers off the front line to go and guard our fuel. It's like, I don't want them guarding fuel. I want them finding bad guys. Uh, but that over-reliance happens, and so it's tough. But we'll fix it. Um. You said that um, it's, they're doing better. What about, I've heard that good things about the base in El Paso. Are there other examples? Tell us more about that. Yes. So the Department of Defense, among the different services, are embarking on experiments, experimental forward operating bases, which is where we send soldiers and Marines out to some pretty austere environments. And they're testing battery technology to see how long a battery can run. They're te testing generators to see how we can keep them running with less fuel, how we can wire together networks of generators so that we have a microgrid in a way that it enables uh, soldiers to do more with less fuel, so we're pumping less fuel out there. And there's experiments going on in Fort Bliss. There's experiments at Fort Benning. Uh, the Marines have a number of experiments. The Navy are doing a lot of neat things. But what's neat about Austin, Texas is we sit in the middle of all those posts, we sit in the middle of oil and gas and renewables and solar. We also sit right in the middle of uh, some of the best academic and intelligentsia when it comes to understanding how all these things come together with the schools that are here in Texas. We also, in Texas, have the only state, it almost, it almost captures El Paso, we're like the only state, though, with our own grid, our own electrical grid, ERCOT, and at the same time, we have the state capital sitting right in the middle of all of it with Camp Mabry, right here, the home of the Texas Army National Guard and Air Guard. And so if we can get all those people to the table together to share each other's common experiences, opportunities, and challenges, real discussions and real opportunities come out of that. One of them that has already started here in, in Austin uh, it started with a conference in the fall called the Defense Energy Summit, and it brought together industry, because again, if they bring their pocketbooks, that helps. Industry, academic, government, civilian, uniformed, all of them came to Austin, Texas, because we sold this story that you can't just do it with pockets of innovation all over the United States. You've got to pick one place to do it well. If you're going to get into film or production of movies and be an actor, where do you move in this country? You move to Hollywood. If you want to sing and write or produce country music, you go to Nashville. If you want to work in theater on stage, you go to Broadway in New York. We want to make it so that if you want to be smart about energy, defense energy, and how to spin it off for commercial application, you move to Austin, Texas. And we have a legacy of doing that. Think about MCC. Think about Symmetech. 
Think about ways in which in the past the government said, in conjunction with industry and academia, we need to pick one place and share ideas rather than constantly fighting back and forth. And MCC was a great example of that right here in Austin, Texas, that brought together all these minds. With the Defense Energy Center of Excellence, that's what we're doing again right now in Austin. And we've applied for uh, the Governor's Office Emerging Technology Funds. You may have read about those in the, in the papers over the last few years. And there's still an opportunity. We've got an application in. I'm not allowed to talk about it because it's literally being deliberated right now. But that would be awesome if we get that seed money to be able to build this. Because what the Department of Defense needs most, because they're so huge is prospecting. People whose full-time dedication and devotion is to be a third-party, disinterested, fair umpire judge, if you will, that says, okay, battery technologies. What are you talking about? For mobile? Mobile. Got it. You're talking about for small technology? Got it. Yes, yeah, small. All right, what are the specifications? You need to be light. You need it to last. You need it to be uh, universally interchangeable between different systems. Okay, got it. Then this group, the Defense Energy Center of Excellence, we then go out to industry. We then go out to university. Because what we can't have is what happens sometimes right now in the Department of Defense. Our leadership that are working on energy issues are being inundated by university, inundated by uh, industry that are all knocking on the doors. I mean, people are literally following them out to the Pentagon parking lot and rolling out a solar blanket saying, I understand you do energy work. Look what we built. Not realizing that the guy he's talking to does large-scale installation stuff not the small deployable stuff that that solar blanket would be. It's so bad that I know one leader in energy in the Department of Defense, after one of his speeches, he left, went off stage, went into the men's room, and a gentleman in the, in the urinal stall next to him was trying to hand him a business card to get to him to say, please call me. And the reason why is the Department of Defense doesn't yet have, because it's such a new idea, this, this idea of defense energy, an apparatus set up. And so that's where I believe entrepreneurs, policy entrepreneurs, Social entrepreneurs that we are, especially here in Austin, Texas, can really get at that. But it will be a national movement, not just an Austin, Texas movement. I just want it to be located here, just like they film movies all over the world, but most of the leadership is in Hollywood, just like Silicon Valley has a, you know, a, a, a monopoly right now on a lot of the tech industry, but it's not all there. Same thing with Austin, Texas. We want to bring all these energy assets, all people of all walks and backgrounds and want to do something well for the thesis that I laid out that our over-dependence on foreign oil and carbon fuel that come from places that don't like us. And, oh, by the way, this has little discussion about climate change. I could talk for another two hours about climate change and what it's going to do to the landscape of the world in terms of rising waters, scarcity of uh, access to clean, potable water. It, it go on and on. Anyway. Yes, I think another. I enjoyed your presentation. Uh, my name Thank is Sylvia Pope. So my question is, for communities that don't have access to uh, public transportation, their rural communities such as Elgin and Lockhart, is Ride Scout available there, or is it more concentrated in the uh, urban core? So the easy answer is yes. Ride Scout can be downloaded for free in iOS and Android anywhere. For, ser for serving communities that don't have a robust public, in uh, public transit infrastructure, we've built into the app now the ability for basically carpooling, dynamic carpooling. So imagine a scenario where in a, in a more mature Ride Scout world when we realize our full vision, as you were coming here, you just say, I'm at home, I'm going to head down to the Public Affairs Forum. Type in the address. As soon as you do that, on that screen you not only see bus, cab, bicycle, if those were options, but in communities smaller where those options aren't there, you would see the names and faces of your friends that are going. And there's two ways we control that. One is when you sign up for Ride Scout, you pick the groups and, and the circles of trust that you're a part of, whether they be community groups or church groups or your LinkedIn friends or your work groups. You pick the groups that you want to be seen and only visible to so that you don't necessarily, unless you want to, open yourself up to give rides to strangers. But in some cases, small towns, there are no strangers. Everybody knows it. But the last thing I'll say, though, especially about small towns, I heard a, a podcast recently, it's probably NPR, that talked about rural community in Ireland. And you can take out the word Ireland and just put Texas in there because it applies. Where the good work being done by Mothers Against Drunk Driving, preventing people from 
getting uh, into their car after having too much alcohol, while that did great to lower the incidence and violence associated with DUIs, what it also did was dry up the sense and fabric of community. Because the sense of fabric of community in small towns often, in evenings, especially on weekends, was everybody going to the local watering hole, carrying on and having a good time, but sadly having few options to get home other than driving their truck or their car back to their place. So in Ireland, you know what their answer to the problem was? That fabric of society was being eroded and bars were closing and restaurants and that whole opportunity for uh, um, you know, entertainment was going away? Their answer was, well, what if we just change the allowable drinking limit and let people drive more drunk? That was their response, as opposed to saying, we can use technologies a little more efficiently if we only knew when a neighbor or a friend was going to the same place or nearby, you are now accessible in all these different communities. And the last thing I'll say to underserved communities is it's a huge personal issue for me because many of our veterans uh, that need medical care and medical attention, they can no longer drive themselves either because of amputation or vision or whatever reason they can't drive. They are reliant upon systems to take them to medical appointments. And they don't always all live close to a hospital. And you and I as taxpayers are paying out outrageous sums of money to take veterans in for their appointments, old and new alike, old veterans and new veterans. But what if, like on the back of your driver's license, you said you want to be an organ donor? What if also there's another checkbox using technology that Ride Scout can facilitate that you said, I'd love to be a veteran driver? Or pick whatever you want. I would like to help the elderly and those that are shut in that can't get to appointments. I'd love to be able to help them. So when there's somebody in my neighborhood that needs a ride. My background check's already been done. I'm not a crazy terrorist criminal. I'm a responsible insurance-laden person, and I can drive to and from. I would be happy to pick up old Sergeant Clark and take him to his appointment, or Miss Simpson to get her where she needed to go. Just call me and let me know. That technology's out there, but it's not, it's not widespread enough, and there are people trying to do it. I mean, church groups, civic groups are already doing great things in mobility, but their reach is only as far as their paper done, paper constructed, phone list. I'm talking about bringing it into the 21st century where it's open, where there are VA lists and there are health care lists and there are community lists and there are church lists and we bring them all together and go, I'll be damned. Look at that. There's somebody who needs an appointment and we can link them together. I hope that answers your question. I just want to follow up on your uh, application to finding where a bus is and how soon it's going to be to a uh, particular yep. uh, uh, bus stop. Is, is this something that you anticipate coming about? Or you it's already there. It's already there. Okay. Yep. All you need is a smartphone. Well, so that's the first step. All you need is a smartphone right now. But I understand that not every American carries a smartphone, uh, but the very next thing that we're doing is, and again, you've got to link the incentives together. I can't do it in every community, but imagine if in the local restaurant, the dry cleaner, the bar, wherever, they had a television screen that faced outwards, not into the store, but through their window out backwards, because they knew that they had a bus stop right next to their hot dog stand. Well, it would make sense for them if people knew that the bus was coming there reliably and knew the schedule and could see it on that screen, they might be more likely to come a few minutes early, have a cup of coffee, have a hot dog, or like me on my way home from work, stop in and have a beer before I hop on that bus. So we're going to make it so that it doesn't require just even having a smartphone, but in places where local restaurants or local businesses can put a screen facing outwards, you'll get the information that you need. Much more dynamically than just a sign on metal tin that's become, you know, uh, faded and worn, especially when buses run late and you need no real-time information. So. so I have a question Please. about, um, you know, there's been a little bit of controversy right now about bringing Uber to uh -huh. town. And my immediate thought was, uh, what about safety and, and insurance? You know, like what condition is the vehicle in? Do they have airbags? Uh, you know, is it a safe driver? And also, your mom always told you never to get in the car with strangers. So you talked a little bit about how you might just limit that to, to people that you know, but what are some of the ways that people can be sure that they're safe to get in the car with someone they don't, maybe don't know? I love this question. I love this whole topic about uh, this new emergence of what they're called transportation network companies. It's Uber, Lyft, Sidecar, Summon, Get. There's a ton of them out there. Maybe not Get. They'd fall into a different category. 
But what, here's what's happening. So you have all these black car sedans, uh, limousine drivers, that were picking people up to and from the airport and picking up corporate clients. And a few years ago, a guy by the name of Travis Kalinick, with the founder of Uber, realized, what are those guys doing when they're not driving around fancy pants people? What if I could give them a smartphone technology and I could connect with them in real time that says, I just want to go down here to this restaurant in between your rides, if you're available, can you take me down there for half price of what a fancy limousine person would be? And they did. And it caught on so fast that people could get picked up by a black car sedan, ride in style like I had only ever done before prom before that in my life, take him to wherever I needed to go in this Lincoln, get out, and off I go. Well, that took off so popularly that Uber now is huge, and behind it is Lyft and Sidecar. But people often ask questions exactly like the way you phrased, which is, what about safety? And I say, what about safety? What aspect? Is it the condition of the vehicle you're concerned about with, or whether you know the driver, or the driver's history? So let's take one fact. Do you know the driver? Great question. When was the last time you got into a cab and you had known the driver before that? You probably didn't. What you were relying on was that he or she had been properly, thoroughly vetted uh, by the city or by the state. What that requires is a driver's license and a criminal background check. And, oh, by the way, the criminal background check has a minimum threshold. There are some crimes he or she can get away with, but just not a certain level. And then that's it. And then the TNCs are doing the same. So that's a fabulous question. My, my quick answer to your question is we need to lower some of the overburdensome regulations on taxis that we have because I'll just tell you the math right now. A taxi cab driver has this equipment and insurance that he pays the company that he works for, like Yellow Cab or Austin Yellow Cab, $325 a week for this equipment. Every week, times all 600 cabs, the cab companies in Austin collect $13 million just from the insurance and this equipment from the drivers themselves. Do you know how much money those cab companies in return give back to the city of Austin for the permits to be able to have that franchise? $400 a car. Okay, That's a little over $200,000 that they return to the city of Austin and they take in proceeds of just from the equipment and the insurance, $13 million. So there needs to be less regulation in taxi to get it more common sense and there needs to be a little more regulation with TNCs to make a little more common sense. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, all these letters and stuff are, are alphabet soup to you, you really ought to start getting into it because it's going to have a real, and I hope, I have a positive impact on Austin and the city council just passed a resolution to study it for six months, which I think is too long, but it co coincides with the city mayor's election in November. So imagine that. Imagine that. And that's the other thing I learned about all this is Politics are so entrenched in energy, so entrenched in transportation. Uh, energy and smart use of clean energy is not a Republican or Democrat. It's not a red or a blue. I want to make it a red, white, and blue issue and return it back to a patriotic angle and not just political. Yes, sir. In the title of your talk, you said that the last two words are climate security. I've heard of climate change. I've heard a lot of things, but that looks like an invented word to me. I'd like for you to expand on it. Climate security. Right. So what we're discovering is we send our Navy, we send our Army, we send our military into places of the world that, in many cases, they don't like us. And the countries that we get to that don't like us, they have a lot of things in common. Specifically, terribly hot, very few natural resources, not a lot of drinkable water, and oh, by the way, if there's any place in the world that argues for what climate change is doing, it's in these places. So A, it's a, it's a, I'll just say it's a breeding ground for people that don't like the United States. When you live miserably, uh, it's really easy to be mad at people who live well, and that's one problem that's going on. But then there's a very specific problem, which is as floods and as uh, water levels rise, and we have a more humanitarian crisis, and we have to send our military there to either secure or provide humanitarian release, we, the military, have a lot of stake in it. So it's more than just climate change. That's what we look at in terms of climate security and how uh, climate change impacts our national security. So I hope I answered your question. Hi, thanks. Ed, can you talk about sort of the push-pull relationship between 
of public sponsored transportation efforts and the private sector where their, the interests of city leaders are to reduce traffic. We definitely have that desire here in Austin, but they may be beholden to some interests who might go about it a different way than using private sector tools. Right. So what we're doing, like Eisenhower said, that you know, history repeats itself, especially for the people who don't read history. 1914, the Jitneys. If you've never heard of this term before, Los Angeles had fabulous uh, transit on electric streetcars. They ran up and down all the major boulevards in, in Los Angeles. They moved people really well and really effectively. Here's the problem. They were privately owned companies, and so when other folks came on and saw these long lines for, public tra for, for this private transit, this guy had a Model T. He said, hey, for that same nickel you're about to give the electric streetcar company, hop in my Model T, I'll drive it right down this very same stretch, and instead of the streetcar going eight miles an hour, the Model T went 15 miles an hour, and they got there twice as fast. So what happened? The people that own the electric streetcar companies went to city government and said, these guys are unsafe. They don't have the same regulations. They don't have the same background checks. You're getting in cars with strangers. There's no way to regulate Pass legislation that makes it so they're safer. So what they do? They said, well, you can't ride your jitney on the same lines as the, as the transit. You can't run your jitneys during peak hours. Basically what they did was they passed legislation that shut out jitneys. The same thing happens in every community every couple decades. So what happened to those poor guys running the electric streetcar companies? The big automobile manufacturer said, hey, these streetcars don't have tires and they don't have internal combustible engines. How can we get rid of them? So the automobile makers bought the electric streetcar companies, took the electric streetcar companies off our roads. You can look this up on the computer. It's a fabulous story in the 1940s and 50s. They have streetcars stacked 10 high in all of these old uh, junkyards, and they brought in buses. But do you know what they did with the buses? Almost nothing. They made the bus experience in America so terrible, the, the car manufacturers did, because they owned them, that they wanted you out of your bus and into what? A car. So we, had, we used to have really good transit that was privately operated, but then in the 60s and 70s, our privately operated bus companies got so terrible, they weren't serving the population, and then guess who had to take them over? The city government. The city government had to start buying and taking over public transit and making it truly public, but A, they weren't really good at it, they weren't really fired up about it, and it wasn't a good cross-section of the population, and it was mainly only serving the people in the community who had no voice. And so when you have something that the people in the community that have no voice are benefiting from it, they you'll end up getting really bad service because no one speaks up on behalf of it. So it's a fabulous case study. I put that paper to you, The Jitneys, written in 1972 by Urquhart and Hilton. If you read that paper, what you see going in Austin today, it won't surprise you one bit. And the only way to solve it is transparency. Get all these facts out there and let everybody know what's really going on. Thank you so much. I think we're out of time, but we want to thank you for coming and all your interesting information. Thank you very much.